Pebbles skittered off my windshield as I spun my cruiser around the bend, coming way too close to plummeting off the edge. I yanked the wheel to the right and tried to steady the car. I could hear my tires chewing up the dirt, feel the rumble as the cruiser left man-made pavement for the crude, rocky soil of the mountain path. Hannigan, if you try a maneuver like that again, I will fucking murder you! I lifted the walkie to my mouth. Roger that, Sheriff. I'll leave the fancy tricks to the pros. I want to catch this guy as much as you, Hannigan, said Marconi's crackling voice. But if it comes down to his life or yours, I expect you to choose your own pansy ass, capiche? Loud and clear. Placed the walkie down and tried to focus on the road ahead. Barlow's car had a few hundred feet on mine, but I could see it each time I rounded another corner of the mountain. A beaten blue Ford slipping between the trees, rumbling like its engine was stuffed with rocks. It was a miracle that piece of shit hadn't fallen apart by now. I rumbled over the bumpy trail as fast as I dared. Marconi was right. It wasn't worth it to blow a tire or go careening into a tree for this guy, no matter what he'd done. There was only one route up the mountain Palmer anyway. Sooner or later, Barlow would run out of road or gas, or that rust bucket of his would finally go wheels up and we'd have him. That was the easy part. Taking down the thing inside of him was another story. Marconi was only a few minutes behind me, so if I could hold Barlow off for long enough, at least I'd have backup. I just hoped it would be enough. I rounded the corner. The mountain plateaued, and a building rose up suddenly in front of me, a ruin of blackened stone tower like a castle in miniature. Three spires at the corner jutted up into the open sky. The fourth had collapsed on itself in a spectacular pile of rubble. All the windows were smashed except for one. It was a stained glass depiction of a woman in a nun habit, her outstretched hand covered in what looked like blood. With no light to shine through, every pane in the window was a deep obsidian black. The tilted sign above the entrance read, Mount Palmer, Insane Asylum. What the hell? I muttered. Then Barlow's car barreled out of nowhere and smashed into my cruiser, knocking me sideways. The seatbelt dug into my neck and squeezed the breath out of me. I spun the wheel and tried to mash the brakes, but we were spinning out of control now, dirt whipping in front of clouds around us. I fumbled for the walkie to radio Marconi when I glanced out of the window again. I found myself staring at the pitch black and rapidly enlarging stained glass woman. Fucking shit, I said. Then my car collided with the window and sent the glass shattering inwards. My head bashed against the side window. Darkness bloomed between my eyes, eating at the edges of my vision, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't fight it. I collapsed onto the steering wheel. The last thing I saw before I checked out was shimmering in the air, like water rippling across the sky and a figure in a flowing black outfit approaching me. Its head was oddly shaped, like it was wearing an angular hat with a long, heavy veil. I closed my bleary eyes as the figure knelt down and peered into my windshield. Well now, a harsh voice said, this just won't do. The rest was darkness. I woke to a soft, maddening glow. A buzzing strip of light that sent barbs of pain through the front of my skull. I looked through squinting eyes at the source of the brightness. It was a medical lamp. Like the one in my dentist's office, but stained a deep yellow and spotted with the corpses of tiny flies. In the darkness outside the light's reach, I saw three figures. One perched in a chair by my side. One bustling back and forth with sharp, pronounced footsteps. And one standing utterly still by a black shape that could have been a doorway. Awareness crept over me, but slowly... There was an accident. Barlow's car. Marconi must have taken me to the hospital. I shifted where I was lying, wincing as my brain prickled with pain. Ah. Where's Marconi? I asked the sitting figure, presuming the doctor. The voice that slipped out of me was faint and dry, barely more than a croak. The doctor leaned over so that the lamplight fell over his face and gleamed off of his thin glasses. Tufts of gray hair sprouted along his ears and in patches along his balding scalp. I couldn't see much of his nose underneath his medical mask, but what I could see was red and scabby. The mouth beneath the mask curled up and crinkled the blue paper. My, my, he said in a surprisingly silky voice. It's awake. The rapping footsteps approached us. Finally, said a sharp, familiar voice. I peered through the lamplight and made out a vague outline of a woman in a nun habit. At first, I had the baffling impression that the top half of her face was missing. It took me a few seconds to realize she was wearing a black veil over her eyes. The eyeless nun tilted her head and tisked at me. Sister Martha found you in the yard, the doctor said. 
A rather unfortunate accident. Your car struck the side of the building and broke a valuable stained glass window. We moved the vehicle to avoid disturbing the other patients. He's destroyed the image of Our Lady Dorcas, Sister Martha fumed. I know you could hardly care, Doctor, but our glorious lady is now in pieces across the kitchen floor, all because of some... some... deranged hooligan in a Flash Gordon costume. What? I said, still groggy. But Barlow! Marconi and I were chasing Barlow up the mountain. My head gave a particularly sharp throb. Looks like a man, but he isn't. He's... he has these... these... suckers for fingers. He, Sticks them to your head, sucks out your brain until you go totally crazy. The doctor turned his glasses to Sister Martha, who shook her head disapprovingly. Dangerous and utterly mad. I don't know where you keep finding them, Dr. Renfield. The lamp flickered and buzzed as Renfield turned back to me. Well, he said softly, I suppose given time, all madmen find their way to our doors. I'm not mad, I insisted. Christ, get Marconi. She'll explain everything. Who the hell are you people, anyway? Sister Martha strode forward and struck me across the face with the back of her hand. Hush your blasphemous tongue. I lifted a hand to touch my stinging cheek, or at least I tried to. When I looked down, I saw that my limbs were bound to the table by a series of crude metal shackles. Cold soberness washed over me. I jiggled my arms inside of the shackles, but they were locked up tight. The metal dug into my wrist and left an ugly red welt. There is something rotten in this one, Dr. Renfield said in that unsettlingly quiet voice. A little touch of sickness in the brain. He traced my forehead with a cold finger. I tried to wriggle away from him, but the shackles kept me from getting far. He found a spot on my temple and tapped it three times. Nothing a few steps won't fix. Deacon, get my tools from the office, will you please? The third shape, who hadn't moved so far opened the door and disappeared down a dark hallway. I could see a single electric torch set into the wall before the door swung shut and brought darkness rushing back. It's a simple enough surgery, the doctor said to me, withdrawing a pen from his pocket. He removed the cap, licking the tip, and leaned in to scrawl a tiny X on my forehead. I winced as the point of the pen dug into my skin. You just make a tiny incision here, he said. Then we drill into the skull and carefully remove the diseased brain tissue. It's a tried and true method. Once the source of the madness has been excised, you'll be on the road to recovery in no time. His voice was low and soothing, as if he was casually discussing the weather instead of how he was going to fucking lobotomize me. What kind of crack doctor are you? I croaked. Did I take a wrong turn and wind up in the fucking twilight zone? I need a bandage and a shit ton of ibuprofen, not brain surgery, let alone brain surgery that went out of fashion in the fucking 30s. Sister Martha struck me again, this time across the mouth. Pain blossomed in my jaw and joined the incessant throbbing in my head. I don't care what you say, doctor, she said in disgust. There's no curing madness like this. It would be more merciful to send him to his maker. Why, Sister Martha, I'm surprised at you, the doctor said. He leaned in close and peered at me, staring down over the top of his scabby nose. I still couldn't see his eyes in the glare of the lamp, and suddenly I was struck by a horrible thought. When Marconi and I had found Barlow in the midst of one of his feedings, he'd been crouched over a prone body, sucking out and slurping the sweet sanity out of his victim. I had startled him with a warning shot, and when he got up, there was no humanity in his eyes, just discs of spinning orange like slivers of molten lava. We already knew that entity from beyond the rift could hop from vessel to vessel, wearing out human bodies like a pair of old jeans. Had the thing inside Barlow jumped into Dr. Renfield? I couldn't see his eyes. How could I know for sure? Don't fucking touch me, I said. I struggled uselessly against my restraints, but it didn't matter. The doctor was reaching over me now, his knobby fingers tracing the bumps of my forehead. I pictured the horrible suckers on the tips of Barlow's fingers and wondered if if that was coming next. If the doctor's light touch would transform into something a, a hundred times more monstrous. I closed my eyes and I took a rattling breath. There was a sudden boom as the door flung open. I lifted my eyelids a crack to see a third shape bustling through then slumped over and out of breath. Doctor! Sister Martha! He wheezed. His voice was young, probably still in his teens, and it carried the slightest trace of an accent, although I couldn't quite place it. What is it? There's... There's been a row, the boy stammered. Uh, Mero uh, got loose in the east wing. It, it punched out two orderlies. Now the, the patients are fighting. 
It's horrible, sister. Just horrible. I, I think I heard a bone breaking. In the name of all that is holy, Sister Martha said, I don't care how mad they are. I will not tolerate this behavior. Not in my asylum. She strode past the boy's shadow and slipped into the hallway, her habit following out behind her. You ought to come too, Dr. Renfield, the boy said shakily. It sounded bad. I, I think you may need to treat the wounded. The doctor's hand lifted from my head with some reluctance, I thought. If you say so, Deacon, he said. He rose from his seat, stretching almost six feet tall, his frame stooped and bony. For a second, I was reminded of another tall, slender figure and shuddered before I could stop myself. I watched as Renfield, in no apparent hurry, passed Deacon and disappeared after Sister Martha. I expected the boy to go rushing after the others, but he just stood there, a solitary figure in the dark. I lay on the medical table and listened as the footsteps grew fainter and fainter, till they faded away entirely from earshot. At once, Deacon rushed forward and produced a tarnished silver key, which he began jingling in the lock of my foot cuffs. Are you hurt? He whispered. The accent in his voice had disappeared. Did the doctor start operating on you? No, I'm fine. Why are you... I don't think you're mad, Deacon replied. I'm going to get you out of here before these monsters come back. Oh, thank God. Did you start that fight? Doesn't take much to set marrow over the edge, Deacon said, wrenching off the cuffs. I pushed his buttons a little until he snapped. There. The shackles on my left ankle came away with a clatter. The boy hurried around the table and began working on the other foot. In a minute or two, I was free and rubbing my tender wrists. Come on, Deacon said, grabbing my hand. The lamplight fell over his face for the first time and I saw a young face. Not quite a kid like I had expected, but a guy in his early twenties or so. He had messy brown hair, cheeks dotted with dark freckles, and a pair of milky white eyes that stared at my face without seeing me. My rescuer was blind. I swung my legs hastily over the hospital bed and let Deacon drag me to the door. Despite his lack of sight, he moved with sureness in every step, not even a bumping into the door frame as he pulled me into the hallway and led me past the lines of electric torches. The bulbs flickered as we passed them. I looked around, hoping to get my bearings somehow, but there was nothing distinctive about the hall. Just cold gray bricks and a series of dark doorways. Where are we going? I asked. Sister Martha's office, he answered. It's the only room in the entire asylum that has a phone. We'll need to call for outside help if we're going to get out of this place. Uh, music to my ears. Hey, how'd you know I'm not crazy? Because you're like me. You're not from this time, right? Excuse me? I said. But on some level, I did know what he was talking about. I think Sister Martha's Flash Gordon comment had gotten the ball rolling, but it wasn't until the doctor had started his whole lobotomy shtick that it really struck me. I'd crashed through another portal and gone tumbling back in time. Crazy in theory, but hey, crazier things happen in the Neverglades all the time. I came from the year 1986, Deacon told me. I was hiking the mountains with my friend Meg when we found the ruins of the asylum. I couldn't see them, of course, but Meg described them to me. She always... She's always been my second set of eyes. We thought we'd explore the place, you know, just for fun. But when we got inside, we were surrounded by voices. I didn't know what was going on. Meg started feeling freaked out, and somebody ripped her hand away from mine, and then... My eyes were gone. I was totally in the dark. I stayed quiet. Mainly because I had to. I guess they assumed I wasn't crazy. Dr. Renfield saw I was blind, and kind of... <sighs> took me under his wing. He never asked where I came from. I pretended to be a foreigner so I wouldn't draw too much suspicion. If I said anything strange, you know, anything that would be out of place for the time period, the doctor let me be as long as I carried his tools and cleaned his chambers and whatnot. When I had time to myself, I felt my way around the asylum looking for Meg. Deacon got quiet for a moment. That was, that was three years ago. They took my friend away, and I... I haven't heard from her since. She could be dead for all I know. Jesus, I said. For the first time, I heard the sounds of distant screaming. High-pitched, miserable wails echoing off the walls, the screams of the mad. I thought of Barlow's victim, how they'd been found slack-jawed and rocking by themselves in the corner, mumbling nonsense under their breaths. Even in our day and age, there was no such cure for that kind of madness. I couldn't imagine how these kinds of people were treated in an era where brain surgery was a totally acceptable substitute for therapy. 
When are you from? Deacon asked. It, uh, the 21st century. I'm a detective. I was chasing a criminal up in the mountains. He crashed his car in a mine and I ended up here. No clue where he went. Even as I said it, I could feel the cool tickle of Dr. Renfield's fingers tracing my forehead. Deacon stopped suddenly outside a door that looked no different from all the others, bar a spiky black crucifix hanging from a nail in the center. He didn't scream Sister Martha's office necessarily, but the implication was clear. Stay far the fuck away. I didn't want to think of how that spiteful old woman would react if she caught us snooping up here. Wouldn't be pretty. I've been here so long, I know almost every nook and cranny. But beyond this point, I'm really blind. I'm gonna have to take it from here. What am I looking for? I asked, placing my hand on the door. This is the early 1900s, so try to find a rotary phone. Just... just dial the operator and phone the police. I don't know if they'll take us seriously, but if we can get friends on the outside, we may stand a chance. Gotcha, I said, looking over my shoulder. The lights flickered and the air was heavy with distant screams, but it didn't sound like anyone was nearby, and that was good enough for me. I pushed open the door and slept inside the room. For an office, the place was pretty barren. A desk with a plastic placemat and an old ham radio sat in the middle of the room, surrounded by wooden chairs and a few sparse bookshelves. There was a slight crackle in the air, and it took me a second to realize the radio was on. The static filled my ears as I approached. The sound got my head throbbing again, so I adjusted the frequency until the static became nothing more but low background noise. When another sound cut through the soft wall of static, a child's sing-songy voice reciting a nursery rhyme, or what sounded like a nursery rhyme, my hand froze and chills skittered up and down my arms. Sticks and stones may break my bones. Swords and spikes impale me. Insects crawl inside my throat and eat the soft tissues of my belly. Leaving sticky webs and clumps of eggs to sprout inside me and burst out in swarms of spiders from my eyes and mouth and ears and every imaginable orifice until my bloated corpse splits at the scene. The voice stopped. And I reached out a trembling hand to turn off the radio, but then a piercing giggle issued from the speakers and stopped me dead. Remember me, detective? The voice of the Legion laughed. I stabbed at the off button and the machine went dark. I backed away from it, shaking, debating whether I should whether I should pick up the damn thing and smash it against the wall. The voice on the radio was supposed to be dead. I, I'd seen the inspector. I'd see the thing's beating heart destroyed in a wall of fire. Had my little time slip brought it back somehow? Was this a, a version of it from an earlier time period? But then how could it remember who I was? The wound on my head resumed its dull, painful throbbing, pulsing with each pound of my heart. I jumped as the door creaked open and Deacon poked his head inside. Any luck? He whispered. I opened my mouth, but whatever I'd been able to say dried up because the radio was gone. Instead, the desk now had a yellow rotary phone, a, a bucket, a paper clips, a stack of lined paper held by a stone angel paperweight. Hesitantly, I lifted the phone to my ear, but there was no sound on the other end of the line. I tried dialing 911, but my fingers got caught in the rotary, and when I finally managed to get the right numbers, I was rewarded with more resounding silence. I placed the phone back and tried to steady my breathing. The lines are down, I heard myself saying. Well, I have to try something else. Deacon swore. There may be a way out in the service tunnels. It'll be a long walk back to town, assuming we get past the guards and the doctor and Sister Martha without getting caught. But one step at a time. I opened one of the drawers with numb fingers and found myself staring at a pile of yellowed papers. Looks like a stack of patient files. I picked them up and leafed through them, not sure what I was looking for. Grayscale photographs stared back at me from each sheet. Pairs of tiny black eyes, some angry, some morose, others just empty. I stopped at a photo of a young woman with frizzy hair and a wide, terrified expression on his face. Your friend, I said to the deacon. Is her name Megan Rosenberg? What? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Why? 
because I think I might have found her file, I replied. I traced the lines of printed text with my fingers. For a few uneasy seconds, it looked like the letters were skittering under my touch, like tiny black insects, but I blinked a few times and the sensation passed. Here, it says that she's in room 39. That's in the East Tower, Deacon said. I I've never had access to the upper story, so I couldn't check those rooms. His voice grew quiet, and I turned to see that his face had gone pale. Detective, I... I can't just leave her. Not if I know where she is. I look back down and find myself staring at another open drawer, one I could swear I hadn't touched. Nestled on a blanket of velvet was an old-fashioned revolver. I reached in and touched the sleek black metal. It was cold. I lifted the gun and examined it in the lamplight. There was a tag dangling from the barrel. So I flipped it over and read the single line of scrawled text. You get three shots. Use them well. I blinked and the tag was gone. Detective, the doctor and Sister Martha are going to be back any minute. I came to my senses with a jerk. Uh, right, I said. I tucked the revolver into the empty holster on my belt. It slid in snug and easy as if it was always meant to be there. My nerves on edge, I closed the drawer and followed Deacon out into the hallway. Let's find your friend and let's get out of here, I said in a low voice. I don't like what this place is doing to me. Deacon nodded and set off down the hall. His footsteps were barely audible despite his hurried pace. I followed him, hand playing nervously at the holster of the stolen revolver. My head was aching again and every shadow seemed to slip away from me when I turned to look. I just wanted to find Marconi and get the hell out of this place, but there was no chance of me getting anywhere without Deacon's help. And no Meg meant no Deacon. So this was a necessary detour. Hopefully, it would also be a quick one. The wails grew louder the further we went. Each patient's cell had a small barred window in the center and his hands would emerge from the darkness as we approached, some reaching out to us, others rattling the bars as if they could snap them in half. I saw a few grimy faces peering out at us, their eyes wide and bloodshot. One person, the long scraggly hair made me think it was a woman but I couldn't be sure, grinned at me with yellowed teeth and then lobbed a hunk of bloody mucus through the bars. I veered towards the middle of the hallway to avoid the ensuing splat. Deacon led me up a few short flights of stairs, winding through hall after identical hall until at last he stopped at a small wooden door. East Tower, he said under his breath. It's locked. We've got no idea where we could find the key. Stand back, I said. I drifted back a few inches, tensed my legs, and launched a kick at the space above the doorknob. The door wasn't nearly as sturdy as it looked. My foot smashed through the wood with a loud splintering crack, leaving a hole just big enough to fit my hand. I stuck it through and jimmied the lock from the other side. The door came loose and opened with a tremendous creak. Someone's bound to have heard that, Deacon said nervously. We've got to hurry. He squeezed past me and stumbled up the flight of stairs, his fingers scraping against the wall. I placed a tentative hand on the revolver and hurried after him. The stairs wound up in a haphazard spiral before opening up into a large circular room. Dark cell doors surrounded us on all sides, broken only by the occasional stained glass window. Each one depicted a hunched figure in various stages of agony or self-flagellation, watched over by a horde of robed men. My skin crawled at the sight. I can't read the numbers, Deacon said, frantically from the center of the room. Help me find her, detective. I tore my eyes away from the windows and approached the closest cell door. A flat white panel on the front read 31. Nothing stirred inside, so I left it alone and hurried past the next several doors. When I reached number 39, I placed my hand on the cold metal and peered between the bars. There wasn't much light up here, but I could make out a young woman with frizzy hair slumped in the corner, rocking back and forth. She was moaning, so low and deep, I almost didn't notice it at all. Her bloodshot eyes stared at a fixed spot on the far wall. I found her. I whispered the deacon. But she doesn't look pretty. Just get her out of there, he pleaded. There was no padlock or anything on the cell, just a large bolt driven into the door frame. I yanked it loose with a loud scrape and opened the door ever so slightly. Meg apparently hadn't noticed the sound. She just continued to rock in place, moaning under her breath. I was just about to step inside and drag her out when a sudden hiss of outrage stopped me in my tracks. I turned and saw Sister Martha standing at the foot of the stairs, her habit spilling about her feet, her eyes still hidden behind that loose black veil. She advanced toward us, her mouth set in a hardened line. I reached absurdly for the revolver for a moment, then lowered my hand. 
Deacon, pale and sweaty, stumbled away from her. I never did trust you, you little wretch, the nun spat at him. God knows what the old doctor saw in you. Her head whipped up to look at me, and I could feel the rage burning in her unseen eyes. And you! The doctor's latest little project. Thought you were going to get free reign of my asylum, did you? That you were going to free my wards? Have yourself a nice little riot? Oh, no, no, dear lord, not while I'm alive. She pointed at the closest stained glass window with a crooked finger. Your punishment will make theirs look like the sweet grace of God. I took a step forward. What are you going to do to me, you old bitch? I said. Slap me again? You don't have your shackles anymore. Any power you had down there is gone. An angry cry rose in her throat. She stormed over to me, habit flapping, and reared back to give me another almighty whack. I leaned to the side and avoided it easily, but then her hand swung back around and struck me square in the jaw. My head exploded in pain again, and I staggered back a few inches. She advanced on me again, but before she could strike, I grabbed the folds of her veil and ripped it clean off. Underneath, one hazel eye glared back at me. The other was gone. A charred and wrinkled cavity was the only thing left of her left eye. She snatched the threads of the veil out from my hand and gave me a violent shove back, her withered lips curling into a snarl. I stumbled back and went sprawling against the door. Deacon appeared in front of me, his small frame standing between me and the fire-scarred nun. He lifted a hand to fend her off, but he couldn't see her coming, and she dodged his reach with the speed of a much younger woman. Then her hands closed around his neck, and the young man started sputtering. I felt ice trickle through me as I saw Deacon's veins pop in red rivers underneath his skin. As something... Something silver, not orange, started to spin in Sister Martha's eye. Bang! I hadn't even realized I'd raised the gun until the kickback bashed my skull against the door. Pain swam in my eyes, but I could see enough to make out Sister Martha staggering backward, hand pressed against a seeping red hole in her gut. Her mouth was opened into an O of surprise, her one remaining eye, wide and hazel, no gleam of silver anywhere. I lowered the revolver and tried to fight the churning in my stomach. A screech came from the cell behind me, and I was shoved aside as the door flung open. A hunched, frizzy-haired shape lunged out from inside. Meg! She continued to shriek as she charged at the staggering nun, her fingers spasming. Sister Martha couldn't even lift her hand to defend herself. Meg slammed into her and began railing on the old woman, driving her back, striking at her arms and head with claw-like hands. The nun wailed and clutched at her wound. I tried to heave myself off the floor to get between them, but promptly tripped over Deacon, who'd fallen prone onto the ground, gasping and wheezing. I scrambled to my feet. Meg had launched herself at Sister Martha, sending both women crashing against and through one of the large stained glass windows. I could only watch as the glass exploded outward as their frail bodies flew together and into the stormy sky before gravity took hold. I didn't run to the window to watch them fall. I only stood, numb, waiting for the inevitable crunch of bones against pavement. I didn't have to wait for long. What the fuck was that?! Deacon screamed. I reached down and lugged him to his feet. He had started to shake and I tried to tell him to get it together, but then, then the wind whistled through the shattered glass and something papery brushed against my hand. I looked down and saw that little tag had reappeared on the barrel of the gun. The wind whipped it back and forth and I saw the line scrawled across it has changed. You get two shots. Down one shell. Come on! I heard Deacon. Come on! I yanked at his arm and turned him to face me. His milky eyes spun in his skull, staring everywhere except at my face. I slapped him and barked, We have to go! His trembling abated. At least somewhat. He took in a few struggling breaths and stared blankly at the wall. The service tunnels, he mumbled. That's our only shot. Can you get us there? I asked, fighting the impulse to shake his shoulders. Yeah, yeah. But... But if Renfield gets wind of what happened to Sister Martha, he'll... He'll have them locked down tight. We have to hurry. A sob broke from his throat. But I didn't give him the time to mourn. I simply grabbed his arm and dragged him down the spiral stairs, through the splintery door, and into the dim hall of cells. Back into the heart of that screaming madness.
Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to take a quick second to say thank you for listening to tonight's video, and quite potentially tomorrow night's or last night's video, depending on how many times I've reused this recording. I especially want to give a big thanks to Eric Mary, John, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Frederick LaRue, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Saeed Alyasin, Tyler Ramberg, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Melissa Siegwert, Szempinski, Daniel Rao, The Ginger Bros, Andrea Solvik, and Andrew Steinberg. You guys and everybody who is supporting on Patreon are the real MVPs. And if anyone would like to join them, you can always check me out at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Or if you'd just like to support the show without, you know, Patreon, then honestly, every view or minute or however you watch or listen to this creepypasta story time on the YouTube live stream or here on YouTube, the podcast on Amazon, Google Play, and on Spotify. And if you'd like to support my wife, then there's nothing better than listening to scary stories with some Dungeons & Dragons themed herbal teas. Etsy.com slash Ivory Monocle Tea. Alright kids, thanks so much for listening, and sweet dreams.